This podcast contains factual information only. It is intended for professional financial advisors and does not contain any personal financial advice. You should not make any investment, insurance or financial decisions based on the content of this podcast. Financial advisors help Australians live better lives. And we're great at it. But what about us? For us to thrive in the coming years, I'm here to ask a very big question. How can we live better, run better businesses, and help more clients along the way? My name is Jessica Brady, and I would love for you to join me as I listen and learn from experts who answer these very big questions. I am lucky enough to record most of my podcasts on Gadigal Land. PlutoSoft is a comprehensive financial planning software and CRM program. It covers every part of the advice process, fact-finding, strategy modelling, portfolio management, life insurance, SOA and report generation. Plus, it includes workflow management and a client hub portal. PlutoSoft helps financial planning firms produce high-quality advice in a fraction of the time and has an extensive range of platform data feeds. As the industry's complete all-in-one solution, PlutoSoft has helped rocket fuel the success of leading financial planning firms around Australia. This week, I chat with Lacey Filipich. Now, she started The Money School. She wrote a book of the same name, and she actually got invited to do a TEDx talk, talking about financial independence, because she retired in her 30s. She talks about why traditional retirement and the idea of that perhaps is a bit narrow and a bit broken. We talk about how she became financially independent, what she learnt along the way, and what she thinks could help us enrich our member or client conversations. Enjoy. Hello, Lacey. Hi, Jess. How are you? Very good. I am so excited for today's conversation. I've made lots of notes. Um, I'm like itching to ask you really specific questions, but I think before we jump into them, because it will make no sense without context, (laughs) for everyone that has never heard of you and your story, I think it's very important that we go back and learn a bit more about you, Lacey, and how you have arrived where you are now. Yes, Can great idea. And thanks for having me, Jess. I'm delighted to be here. Um, and agreed, I probably do need to give some context because I might be one of the few people who, on your show who is not an advisor or a finance professional. So very important to give that mm-hmm. uh, information up front. I'm actually a chemical engineer. And how on earth does a chemical yes. engineer end up in money? Yes, that's a, a very interesting story. Well, of course, I would think it's interesting. That's sort of self-selecting there, isn't it? Um no, what happened it was interesting. <laughs> it, is, it was so interesting. Oh, thank you. Well, uh, we'll see. We'll let the listeners be the judge after they've heard the story. Um, so I started out <laughs> loving maths and science at school, but also loving economics. And I had a tough choice to make when I was graduating from year 12 in Brisbane. And that was, did mm-hmm. I want to go into business and commerce or did I want to go into something like engineering? And I chose engineering because I love problem solving, which I think – Now that I've done engineering and done some money stuff, problem solving is actually a common factor for financial advisors too, right? It's not dissimilar. Um, But I was just very lucky that I happened to pick chemical engineering because it did suit me to a T. And I was a chemical engineer. And chemical engineers, you find wherever you take a raw material and convert it to a final product. So we're very popular in oil and gas and in mining, but you'll also find us in water treatment and in all sorts of beverages like wine and beer and distilleries. Um, We're all over the place and it's a wonderful career. I absolutely loved it. And while I was studying and then starting work as an engineer in the mining industry after working in Kalgoorlie, I moved from Brisbane to Kalgoorlie, 4,000 kilometres when I was 21, the red light Mm -hmm. district of Australia, as I later learned, Mm -hmm. very interesting place (laughs) after having grown up a very sheltered childhood in Brisbane. Um, Mm -hmm. I was, yeah, it was an an education all unto itself. Um, I had been saving since I was 10 years old. I've saved half of every dollar I've ever earned. I still do that 30 years later. And in my second year of university, I bought my first property and I bought that one. It was a little tiny two by one apartment to live in. And all of my professors, 
uh, tutors and my colleagues at, at uni thought I was insane. What was I doing buying a property at 19? Mm-hmm. But that was the beginning mm-hmm. of me starting to invest really proactively. And I kept investing um, again in property and then moving into shares. And of course, being an engineer, you get a very good wage and I'm very cheap to run. So yep. I was able to amass quite a lot of wealth in my 20s making the most Mm -hmm. of the mining boom that I had graduated into. Lucky me. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, Excellent timing on my part. I wish I could claim Mm -hmm. that was by design, but just luck, right? Um, Out of that, of course, I was um, getting to a point in my career, which happens to a lot of people in their 20s where they have these crises. And I had a few crises happen to me in quick succession. It made me think about redesigning my life. And I started taking mini retirements, which meant that I would work about half the year and I'd spend the other half doing what I felt like. Um, And my friends started asking me, how come you don't have to work full time? How come you can just have these leisurely holidays where you do whatever the heck you feel like doing? And I was like, well, you know, my shares are paying me dividends and my properties are paying me rent and I've saved up a big wad of cash to get me through this period. What have you been doing? And they'd all been getting credit cards and car loans uh, and most of them didn't have savings and hadn't thought about investing. And I think that was the point at which I went, oh, so not everybody gets taught this stuff. I hadn't really thought about it much. You just sort of think that what Mm. you have happens to everybody, don't you? You know, that your parents will teach Mm. you the same way. It's like it's a parenting manual. Now that I'm a parent, I realize there is no manual. There is no instructions. There's just you making it up as you go along. Um, And I've just been really lucky. Really, really lucky. I talk about winning the ovarian lottery with my mother, who was an accountant, and she taught me about money, and mm-hmm. I had picked up on those lessons and loved them. My dad had also taught me. I love him dearly, but he taught me through going bankrupt, so I saw what not to do. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. And so that was the point at which I was like, this is unfair. Like I've, I've had an unfair advantage over people because I've learned this stuff in my youth. I really think everybody else should learn about it. And that was in 2010 that I started money school. So it was specifically at that point to teach parents how to teach their kids about money. That was my first model. I was like, well, I'm going to take everything that my mum taught me and I'm going to show parents Mm. how to do that with their kids. And it was a year Mm -hmm. before it got put into the curriculum at school. So when that happened, I thought, oh, well, that's going to solve the problem. They're going to put it in the curriculum and it'll all be sorted. Here we are 12 years yeah. later. Mm, not fixed yet. Not fixed yet. Um, we we still have not cracked that nut. Uh, so I find myself now these days teaching people from all walks of life about money. I teach people of all ages because, of course, what happened, I was teaching all these parents how to teach their kids about money and then all these 40-year-old women with no kids started coming to me saying, that's lovely, Lacey, but can you just teach me? I didn't learn. Mm -hmm. Uh, And they'd all had that Mm. crisis moment that we see happening in our 40s where we look at our superannuation balance and go, oh, my gosh, that's not enough. How am I going to live when I can't work? Mm -hmm. And so so now, yeah, I teach a broad range of people. I teach uh, kids directly but through an enterprise experience. I make them start their own business and then I teach them about money. It's like a covert financial capability program. Um, I've got a book with – um, Penguin, which is very exciting. It was lovely to be commissioned by them. That was a nice surprise. And um, I've got a TED Talk in which I talk about um, financial independence and the mini retirements that I mentioned earlier. So that's kind of what I do with my days. Talk about money, try to make it a little bit less scary for people and encourage them to choose their own adventure. Hence why you're here. This is so <laughs> exciting. So exciting because, you know, for, for me, Lacey, I work predominantly with 25 to 45 year olds. So I would argue a demographic that financial advisors often haven't or haven't wanted to work with because they haven't um, had and I'm using inverted commas enough money. Um, and can I just say 99.9% of them want a situation where they could work for six months and sort of do these mini retirements and have purposeful, what I call non-traditional retirements, which we're going to talk about. So I am delighted to be able to learn from someone who's actually done it because I haven't. Um, Although I am about to take a three-month break, so I think I'm about to embark on my first mini retirement, which you will be proud of. Very um, exciting. So that I can practice, yes, so that I can practice what I preach because I think it is quite important if you're going to help people to do these things, you've got to do them. Um, But you've just talked about so many things that have piqued my interest. I'd like to just pause on a few of them if we might, if we may, and, and sort of unpick them. So you had been taught from an extremely young age good money behavior. Can we talk a little bit about that? So mum 
didn't force you to save 50%, but how did, how did it come about that you were saving half of whatever you were given and, and how did you get money actually? Were you required to work for it? Did you just get pocket money? How were those in, uh, behaviors instilled from an early age in your house? Well, I think the overriding sense that I can give people, because I speak to a lot of parents now who really want to do what my mum did and they ask for a recipe. Mm. Now, my I wouldn't say that I have a recipe, but what worked with me really well for my mother, and I do think it works well with most kids because you can tailor it, is rather than lecturing, just planting a few little seeds. So, not this, I'm going to sit you down today, we're going to learn about saving, Jess, and I'm going to teach you about compounding and here we go, buckle in for an hour and we're going to look at graphs. You know, I can't think of any anything less interesting. Little tiny okay. seeds are, are what worked mm. and, and specifically asking questions as well. So, what actually happened was I had, my parents had split up when I was eight and my okay. mum was a single mum. Um, and my mm. dad didn't pay much child support. I love him, but he ran his own business and he spent a lot of money um, mm. and he didn't pay regular child support. He still did contribute, but it wasn't reliable. So my mum okay. was earning, you know, sub 30 grand a year supporting two girls mm. and working. And so mm. it wasn't that um, I knew that I didn't really know that we were poor, but we were quite poor. And yep. I never noticed because I always felt safe and loved. You know, I'm one of the very lucky ones who mm. who never felt unsafe. I never had a housing insecurity, mm. never had food insecurity. So although I had that experience and I remember listening to the podcast you did with Jenny Rolf Wallace where she mentioned, you know, find a single mum, best budget is in the world, that was my mum. Yeah. And so I was very conscious of money and we could earn money through chores and we did start off with mm-hmm. a fixed, you know, a certain amount a week and I got the ironing, like the worst job in the world. I hate ironing um, oh, as my sort of division too. of labour. <laughs> I got the ironing and I hate it. I hate it. I will I know, not it's iron awful. now. Yeah, I sorry. won't either. I, my clothing purchases are predicated on the idea of this must not require ironing. Um, <laughs> that It is a thing, I think. But, you know, it was a, an important way to contribute to the household. Mm-hmm. But what had happened was I was so interested in money um, and I was learning about budgeting in those couple of years from eight to 10 that I wanted to get hair wraps. Now, this will really date me, but hair wraps where you used to like get a bit of hair and they'd wrap cotton around it and oh, yes. um, it would stay in your hair for like a month, you know, like said, so all some patterns mm-hmm. and beads. And I wanted to go get that done. And I went to the South Bank markets in Brisbane and they were charging a dollar an inch. And I was watching the person do it. And I was like, oh, I can do that. And I taught myself how to do it. And so I started charging 50 cents an inch instead of a dollar an inch. Um, and before I knew it, I had this little business. I had five of my friends employed um, and we were running a stall. And he was doing really well. Okay. So that was, you know, like a kidpreneur, we would call that experience. My first kidpreneur experience of running a business when I was 10. And we were in the car going to the first official big market where me and my five friends were setting up a stall. And mm-hmm. it was going to be a big day. And it was very exciting. And my mum, Driving the car just said to me, what are you going to do with the money you make? And I was like, oh, I'll buy something, maybe some lollies. And then she said the line that got me saving, which was, did you know that when you put your money in the bank, the bank will give you more money for that money? I said, what? And she was like, well, yeah, it's it's called interest. The bank takes your money. And, of course, back then we're talking about like early 90s, right, 10% interest rates. So very Mm -hmm. attractive compared to Mm -hmm. the maybe 3% you might get if you're a child at the moment if you're really lucky and it's probably more like 1% or 2%. Mm -hmm. Anyway, but she Mm -hmm. was like, oh, you put that money in the bank and then the bank gives you money to say thank you for putting your money in the bank. And then next year you earn more money on the money they gave you and that's called compounding. I was like, what? What? Excuse me? How does – wow, why? And so, like, I started asking questions and she started explaining to me about how banks need that money to be able to create other money for people, you know, capital adequacy laws basically, which I didn't learn the name of for another 25 years, but that's what she was explaining to me. And and that was how she got me thinking about compound interest. And so my eyes just went ding. I was like, that is amazing. And we walked away with $300 and 150 of it went straight into saving. And that was it. Every birthday, every pocket money, every time I earned anything and I was like committed to working, I started working part-time as soon as I was legally allowed, 13 years and nine months. And before that, I'd done everything you could do, like babysitting and paper rounds and all that kind of stuff. Um, yeah. But I never worked less than 12 hours a week during high school um, and into uni every holidays. I'd work 30 hours a week. I did before and after school care and vacation care and I coached gymnastics and they were all really well-paid jobs. And so I was just sucking away savings, still spending half of it, still having a great time. But because my friends were out at Macca's earning $5.60 an hour and I was coaching artistic gymnastics 
with a professional qualification uh, at $15 an hour, I didn't have to work as hard as them to make as much money mm. and I still was able to save. So there was a bit of a lesson in there for me about being able to find higher paid work, like not just going, oh, I'll take the Macca's job, you know, it took me a lot longer mm. to get the gymnastics qualification, but the payoff was so much better. Yep. All that sort of stuff happened and it was all these little conversations. My mum would just plant these seeds. They were never big lectures. And so when I went to buy that first property, it was the same thing. I had this you know, chunk of savings and I was all excited. I was going to go buy a nice car. All my friends were driving hideous, ugly old cars. And I was like, man, I can get like an $8,000 car. Whew, look at me go, 19 <laughs> years old. And my mum went, that could be part of the deposit on a property, Lacey. And I was like, what? Hold on. You know, same thing again, just one little line. You know, uh-huh. it, it wasn't a lecture. It wasn't anything like, hey, you should do this. Hey, it would be a great idea if you did this. Just a question or a comment and enough for me to go, oh, What? Now, my sister was totally different from me. She had a very different attitude to money. So my mum didn't use the same strategy with her, Mm. but it always started with questions or single comments, never with lectures and never with instructions about this is what you should do. It was always about Mm -hmm. reasoning and trying to find the thing that piqued our interest. So I know that's a very long explanation, but I take that time because I think parents need to understand you don't have to lecture. You don't have to have the answers. You're better off letting your child guide you a little bit and being prepared to respond. And, and trying to trigger that interest in their mind and finding what is that interest for them because every kid is different. Um, you say this through the lens of a parent and a child, but I want you to know <laughs> it is most definitely interchangeable between a financial advisor and the people that they work with because oh, I, <laughs> I think we spend a lot of time telling people what to do instead of making those small, very impactful comments that help people sit with a problem and go, is this really what I want to do? And so I'm giggling because I don't have children um, (laughs) because I think to myself, oh, this wouldn't just work with a child. This would work with all of us. And, and, you know, when I was listening to, I was listening to your story and I thought, I wonder how different her life would be if she bought the car. And not only (laughs) if she bought the Car, but if she bought the car and she got a car loan to buy the car, I really feel like that was such a pivotal moment that sort of helped dictate where you went and what the foundation really looked like for you. Because as you say, your friends ended up in the very normal, because we have completely normalized debt on depreciating assets and we don't have enough time in the day to talk about why that's a problem. Um mm. And they've set themselves on a path where debt becomes normal, credit cards are a thing, and yet you went the complete opposite way. And it set you up for the ability to effectively replace your income in your very early 30s, which is such an an amazing achievement. And, And congratulations, because that is clearly something that you've worked very hard for. And you were strategic. You were strategic when you were 10. So well done you. <laughs> well, it's an interesting thing, isn't it? You don't necessarily see what's going to play out over the long term. I didn't ever start saving thinking I want to be financially independent. I actually just abhorred waste. That was it. I was like, I'm not going to waste mm. this money. I've invested so much time. Mm. So it was, it wasn't like a, a the strategy. I, I think of myself more as being opportunistic more than anything else. I suddenly realized, oh, this works, you know, that kind of thing. It's a really important point, but that normalization of debt is huge. And I often when I'm talking to young people particularly, the way I'll frame it is I will say, I'm so grateful to past Lacey. You know, if I could go back to 10-year-old Lacey or 19-year-old Lacey and say, go girl, you know, I would be so, you know, proud of what those choices that I made. It it really, I am proud. I'm glad. A lot of it was I had a headwind, I had good timing. But I also took the decision. So there's, there's that, you know, there's that circumstance, but also some personal stuff. So I yeah. absolutely recognize the circumstances and the luck I had. And then there's the, but I would still give me a pat on the back for having the guts to do it. And then I, I, I so I try to get people to hug. frame that that way. Yeah. I hug, a giant hug if we were. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And a, yeah, a big hug would be good. Yeah. yeah. And, and that. So, so that's how I like to frame it with young people is the decision you make is going to set future you up. Mm. Now, how do you want future you to be set up? Because those decisions, that decision about whether to take on that debt or not, future you is paying that debt, Mm. right? That's, you know, and I did have a friend who used to always say, her name's Becky. I love Becky. She's delightful. She would always say, oh, that's future Becky's problem. (laughs) And I'd be going, yes, it is future Becky's problem. 
What's future Becky going to say about the car loan? What's future Becky going to say about the credit card? What is future you going to say to yourself when mm. you make this decision? Are they, are they going to be grateful? And, and look, we're going to make mistakes. I don't think there's a question of that you have to be always right. So you would berate past you for getting something wrong. Yeah. If you made the decision in good faith and, and you were trying the best you could, then are you going to be proud that you, that you took that decision. I think that's a really important way to frame it. And that thing about asking questions is massive. We do the same thing. I did a lot of operational improvement consulting, which is basically I get hired to come in and help mines make more tons without spending any money. That's the way that gets referred to. I learned the same thing. You never point at the problem and go, there's your problem. You ask questions around the edge mm. of the problem mm. and try and get people to come to these realizations. And they're not you know, pointed rude questions, but it's more, oh, how do you feel about that? To try and get them to see the problem yeah. themselves because it will be that much more impactful. And I can imagine in those advice discussions how important that skill must be, trying to get people to engage so they're not just on autopilot and they don't just want you to make the decisions for them, but so that you can extract from them where do they want future future them to be so that you can help them make good decisions. And it's um it's an interesting space because we are we are taught all of the financial stuff and really we have to recalibrate how we can help because we can have the best investment advice in the whole wide world. But if someone isn't able to understand why they need to stop behaving in a way that is reckless with their money and therefore they have nothing to save at the end of the month, the investment conversation goes completely out the window. So Absolutely. I'm fascinated in these in these um, ideas and thoughts because it's an area that I – believe I can do better in and therefore I think others can learn with about that as well. <laughs> now, well, the hard part about that, if I can add one thing, please. The, the really difficult thing is I think for people to realize and they don't know what's happening to them. When you are in financial stress, your IQ drops by 13 points on average. I'm not sure if you've seen that research out of Princeton. So no. that was a study done in 2013. Fascinating research. What they started off with was uh, farmers in India who earn 60% of their annual income in one month because they harvest. So they did the test before when things are very spare and people are hungry, and they took 700 to 800 farmers, 760 I think it was, and they tested them after, a month after they got paid when everyone's flush, and their IQ was 13 points different. They were smarter when they had more money. The same thing happens, though, in Western society. They did the test then with car maintenance, I believe. So they, you went in to put your car in for service and someone came out and said, okay, well, um, it's going to cost $150 for this repair. Everyone did an IQ test when that happened. And then they came back and said, oh, we're so sorry, we got it wrong. It was $1,500, not $150. And then they tested IQs again. Now, everyone who had uh, $1,500 was more than a week's income, their IQ dropped. People who it was less than a week's income, their IQ stayed the same. So what they're able to measure is it's cognitive load. Your brain, when you are stressed financially, because in the back of your mind is, can I afford the rent? Can I afford the car payment? Can I afford the school fees? Um, am I going to lose money on this investment? That actually chews up some of your brains, the equivalent of a CPU on their computer, and you can't make as good decisions. So you've got a challenge when people are financially stressed particularly if they've brushed it under the carpet and they've just ignored it, that they're actually not making as good a decision as they could. Just in any area of their life, people make bad relationship decisions, they make bad career decisions, they make bad investing decisions compared to where they could be. So this premise of um, poor people make bad decisions actually in reverse. We all make bad decisions when we're poor. And if you're in an advice situation where people are not able to see that they're stressed or can't even – free up some of that CPO because that, that 13 points is an average. The acute is like 40 points, which is huge. Oh, huge. Yep. yep. So some people who are like worried about their ability to eat or anything like that, they're like, they cannot, they can't process. Yeah. So through asking those questions, you can start to pick up whether people are in that state or not, because if they are in that state, they have to try and get out of that state before they can make good decisions. And that's where an advisor is actually really critical, being able to flag for them that they go, oh, oh, wow, I'm, my brain's not in the right space to make this choice. Mm. And, and it is important to recognize it happens to every area of your life. That that financial stress actually plays out across every area of your life because it's a cognitive load. You, you're basically chewing up your brain space. Um, I have had very limited experience with that, and that is such interesting research. However, the only thing that I can think of that does uh, lend itself to the conversations I have personally had 
I've been an advisor for five years, um, is very recently separated people. Very, very, like very raw, very recent. And what I say to them is, listen, right now you don't, you may not see it, but you're in a fog and it is absolutely not the right time to make very big financial decisions as long as you're safe and your money is safe. And we need to just keep sort of everything ticking along for the moment and recalibrate in a few months when actually there's been time to process because you can actually see that they are absolutely not in the right headspace to make big decisions. And of course, particularly people that are, you know, professional and pragmatic, they want to get on and they want to tick boxes and, you know, move on with their lives and try to restart, but it's just not the right time. And so that research helps support the conversations that I've had. So thank you. Um, (laughs) Fascinating, scary, and undoubtedly correct. Uh, Can we talk about your burnout and how it impacted your beliefs and thoughts about retirement? Absolutely. So you probably gathered from me talking about starting work as soon as I was legally able and running my own business that I have always worked hard. Working hard's in my genes in a lot of ways. I think a lot of us pick it up from our parents. And although Mm -hmm. my dad went bankrupt, he did run his own business and he worked like a demon. Like he would have been working 80-hour weeks most of my childhood. My mum at one stage was working 80-hour weeks as well as the financial controller of an events company as she progressed through. So I saw my parents work very hard and I just thought that was normal. And so it's probably not normal for a 14-year-old to be working 12 hours a week during the school term and 30 hours a week every school holidays. It's uh, it's probably not considered quite normal, but I just thought it was. I thought it was the best way to make money and um, Mm. I had lots of energy back then. And so when I got into my career in mining, mining has a lot of shift work and long hours. And when you go to a mine site, if you are a credible female, you'll get promoted quickly at the moment, like bluntly, Mm. because Mm. they are really working hard to try and get women into positions of management so they can really swing that. And and that really started, you know, back when I was there, you know, first year out was, you know, it's 18 years ago now. It was very Mm -hmm. evident. So I could have as much challenge as I wanted and as much push as I wanted and as much promotion as I was keen for. So I got promoted to superintendent level, which is quite high at 26. That's very young to be managing a team. Yeah. But part of that was um, I was just keen, really keen. I was happy to work weekends and happy to work nights and just really up for the challenge. And I worked myself too hard. I had 18 months where I was doing very stressful work, which is um, trying to get people to make more tons without spending any money. And you actually need like a force of personality to get operators who've been on a site for 40 years to change. Mm. <laughs> it's, you've got to you've got to almost charm them. Um, I get told I've got a lot of charisma. I think I developed it trying to convince these poor old blokes who just wanted to do their job to just do it this little bit better because the company was going to make a bit more money and we were going to be a bit safer and we are going to spend a little bit less. And um, it's really intense, really intense work. And I did 18 months straight um, without a holiday. And I knew I was getting tired and I had said to my boss, I need a break. And he said, you can't have one till the end of this project and that's six months away. <gasps> and at month four – I um, caught a virus and I was bedridden for five weeks Mm. and it was because I had not looked after myself. I had not been eating properly. I had not been exercising. I had only been working and flying a lot too. That's very common Mm. in the mining industry. And I was just so keen to prove myself that I hadn't been monitoring that. So the virus that maybe everyone else would have shaken off might not have had a big impact knocked me for six And I honestly did not know if I was ever going to get out of bed again. I thought I was going to be in bed. You know, in week four, I was just like, oh, my gosh, am I ever going to be all right again? And that's a really horrible feeling in your 20s because you're used to being invincible. That was my Mm -hmm. first, oh, gosh, I'm not invincible moment. Um, And, of course, I did get better, but that um, burnout, that virus took half my hearing. Um, So my, uh, my right ear, I've got moderate hearing loss. So always talk to me from the left. People will notice very quickly. Um, one day I'll get a hearing aid, but I'm just fighting it. And mm-hmm. I had also from grinding my teeth cracked both of my rear molars. Um, mm-hmm. That's not something I'd ever done as a child. And I started grinding to the point where I split my teeth in two. From stress, um, right? Stress, yeah, at night. Yeah, just grinding, grinding, grinding in my sleep. So I, um, that was a real wake-up call, like a mm. real like, oh, my gosh, well, do I want to yeah. do this for the rest of my life? And, of course, I took three months off. I went traveling around South America with my uh, then partner, who's now my husband. 
also mm-hmm. an engineer, also in mining. Mm-hmm. And um, that was a very romantic. Lots of girl engineers meet boy engineers at work. That's a very common theme because um, we're so oh, yeah. socially inept. Just kidding. Um, sorry <laughs> to any engineers or people with engineering children or relatives. <laughs> I'm sure we're not unusual. <laughs> um but yeah, we took three months off. We went traveling around South America and I went, oh my gosh, there's a life beyond Australia. I hadn't done any really serious traveling. I'd only ever done little holidays. And that was a real eye opener for me. And I thought, wow, fantastic. I want more of this. Um, and then of course, a couple of other things happened in quick succession afterwards. I got that promotion to superintendent, which was like supposed to be exciting and was actually really depressing. Loved the team, but it turns out it doesn't matter how far you go up in a company, you just more meat in the sandwich. It's just more stress. Still don't mm-hmm. have autonomy. I was looking for autonomy. I thought I'd get to make changes, you know, like mm-hmm. the uh, the good old Spitfire pilots who believe they can change things, you know, but their life expectancy is two weeks. Um, yeah. That kind of attitude. And then my little sister ended her own life. And mm-hmm. so that was another, oh, my gosh, because she chose to leave. She's only 24. Yeah. So I had that experience of the burnout, the, the promotion that wasn't what I thought it was going to be, and then my sister choosing to leave. And I just had this like, oh, <gasps> life is short. Mm. Nothing is guaranteed. Yeah. Why would I wait? Why would I wait? And someone uh, gave me the book, The 4-Hour Workweek by Tim Ferriss, which I read. And look, there's a lot in there that's very interesting. Some of it's outdated now. But the thing that stuck with me from that was this idea of instead of waiting till your 60s or 70s to enjoy some time off, bring some of that time into your youth while you're young. And I just had that trip, right, that three months. I was like, yes, of course, of course I want to have more of these breaks, these mini retirements early in life while I'm young and fit enough and Mm -hmm. can do what I want. I don't want to wait till I'm like in my sixties. So I'll start doing that now. So that's what I started doing. And so for the next three years, I worked six months always over winter and I would have um, the summers off and my partner and I would go and live in a little surf town um, down South in Western Australia. uh, And we would cook fantastic food and we would exercise and we would hang out and we would indulge in whatever we'd been wanting to learn about or do, which at the time for me was a lot of winery lunches and cooking uh, and I, and writing, I, I wanted to learn how to write. Um, Adam watched a lot of Top Gear and um, hung out a lot. Like it was just, it was about relaxing for him. And, but we kept doing that. And so over, I think five years, we totaled 22 months off in a five year period, um, always in chunks of three to six months. And so this is known as the, the sort of fire well, you were doing a bit of a hybrid, but, you know, the, the financial independence and retiring early and bringing forward, you know, the, the idea that, you know, you have to wait and work for 40 years to have that time. I think that this is a conversation that financial advisors need to talk more about uh, because we we probably do still focus way too much on, you know, you turn 67 and then, you you know, you're going to – you might transition a little bit oh, earlier. Yes. What was it like having the freedom? And, and probably just in case um, people are wondering how you do it. Obviously, over that time while you were working, you were building assets and buying properties and, and investing in shares and and the like. But in terms of going from a million miles an hour and grinding your teeth at night to the point where you cracked them to planning for six-month six breaks, what was it like having the freedom? It is intimidating and exhilarating all at once, as you can imagine. Um Each time I took a mini retirement, I didn't have clear plans. We didn't have like a, okay, well, we're going to kick a goal because I'm a very goal-oriented person, very to-do lists, weekly goals, monthly Mm. goals, like I deadlines, man, I I eat deadlines for breakfast, you know. There's none of this. If there's a deadline, it will get hit. Um, very engineering uh-huh. trait, very, very typical sort of organized person. I have the, the uh, indubitable honor from my um, commissioning editor of being the only person who hit every date in the publishing schedule. Um, so that I wanted to not do that. I wanted to stop that. So we didn't make detailed plans. We didn't have, you know, huge amounts of things scheduled. What I found very interesting is it took me about a month to unwind each time, a month to get used to not waking up to an alarm, to not feeling like I should be doing something with my time. There's this horrible part of society that's common that anytime you're sitting around doing nothing, lying in a hammock in my case most of the time when I was on these mini retirements, would be classed as being idle and that would be bad, not yeah. productive. And I yeah. come back to that discussion about with financial advisors. I, I had an absolute headbutt motion, moment with this one fan, financial advisor when I was about 33 so, you know, seven years ago now, she and I were having a coffee because I like to meet 
um, people who are in the industry because I get asked to refer a lot and I will never do financial advice. So I need to have people who I can trust, who I can refer to. So we're having coffee and she was having a go at me because I hadn't put money into super um, voluntary contributions. <laughs> She's like, you should be doing that. Why are you not doing that? And I was like, um, because I invest my money. And then my investments pay for me now. Why would I put money into super and it would be locked up for another 30 years? If I did what you said, I would still be at work. And she was like, no, you wouldn't. I'm like, yes, I would. There is an opportunity cost for every dollar. And if I had taken a dollar and paid the 15 cents tax and got 85 cents, great. That goes into my super. I paid whatever it was, 30 to 40 cents tax, depending on. So I got less. But guess what? I have that money now and I don't have to work and you do. So – can you see why that's not good advice for me? And she was pig-headed about it and just would not concede the point. And I was like, and this is why I will never refer to you because there is not one way to live. And, look, it's a common thing. She's, mm. she's not – I don't blame her. Mm. This is that whole industry. Like even Money Smart, our financial educator, you want to go onto their retirement calculator, you cannot put an age less than 60 into their retirement calculator. I know. You cannot put in 40. You cannot put in 50. 60 is the youngest because they think, no, no one should be sitting around idle. So the systems are not designed to cope with that and the, the, the traditional models aren't designed to cope with it and I think it's a travesty because it's not that people sit around doing nothing. Everyone I know who's achieved financial independence is doing amazing stuff. They're just not motivated by money anymore. They don't need to be motivated by money anymore. And it's this liberation point where I think we free up all this brain space of these amazing people to solve problems that they wouldn't solve if they were just sitting there worried about their next paycheck. I love this so much. And there are some financial advisors I know that are listening right now going, what on earth is she talking about? Hold space for new and different conversations and really sit with what Lacey's saying and, and understand from her perspective um, she has a different point of view and she has retired from 30 30- uh, one and has been doing some really exciting stuff since then, but I can imagine their advisors who have literally just like their brain has, you know, that part around the IQ, their brain has stopped, their brain has stopped and they didn't hear anything else yeah, from that moment of on. Course. But here's what I would like you to have, to try and change if that's what you're getting stuck on. So FIRE is an acronym, FIRE, Financially Independent Retiring Early, I think is actually the wrong acronym. In my book, Me I too. say it's Financially Independent Time Rich. Financial Independence yes. makes you time rich. You yes. get to choose how you spend your time. That's it. So don't think of it as retiring early. There's no way you'd class me as retired. I still work, right? I just don't have to have a regular paycheck anymore because I don't need one. And if I need to take time off, like when my mum got sick, you know, she yeah. got sick for four months and I had to be a full-time carer, I closed my business down. I didn't have to worry about money. I didn't have to worry about whether I was going to be able to eat or not. I could choose because I am time rich. Because I get to choose how I spend that time. So if your brain is just going, why would you retire in your 30s? It's not retiring. It's becoming time rich and choosing how you spend your time. You know, I, I only can talk about the experience that I have with, with the members that I work with. But what I hear over and over and over again, Lacey, is I want freedom and I want choice. And when I ask them to to really define that, I'm like, what do you, what do you mean? Like, do you want to retire early? Most of them struggle, really struggle with the idea of retirement because we have a very tiny sort of narrow view of what retire, you know, playing golf on Wednesdays and sitting under a <laughs> kind of, which is lovely for a few weeks. But what I try to say to them is, listen, you don't have to do nothing, but it's probably the choice to be able to work on projects that you're passionate about, or maybe you're going to go and write a book, or maybe you go and do some community work, and then you see their little face light up again. They're like, oh, yeah, that, yes, that's what I, whatever that thing is, that's what I want. I'm like, yeah, that's just a non-traditional retirement. But do you feel like because retirement has been pegged as like these graying folk on a beach, you know, holding hands and their grandchildren in the in the foreground – we haven't done a good job of saying there's an alternate here and you don't have to sit and do nothing. You can actually have the money, the time, the space, the freedom that you're talking about, as you say, to go and fix big problems. Can you talk a little bit more about what you're seeing people who are financially independent do with their time and their most valuable resource, their time? Yeah, exactly. It is your most valuable resource. So there's all sorts of people that do this kind of thing. And I think mm. what we often hear and the first response people have is, oh, you can only do that when you have a massive income. 
And I always refer them to my mother's story. So my mum didn't start investing until she was 49. Mm -hmm. And she got to financial independence when she was 63. Now, that's only two years before retirement age, but it turned out to be a very important two years because she passed away when she was 70. So imagine if she'd worked till she was 65, you know, mm. working till you're 63 is pretty good. Mm. Now, and she did it on a moderate income. Now, her motivation, for example, was being able to support me and hang out with my kids. She wanted to be grandma. You know, mm-hmm. she moved 4,000 Ks from Brisbane to Perth to be with us. She saw my kids four or five times a week. Mm-hmm. We did lots of activities together. Um, she did was also trying to help me have time to write, you know, things like that and run my business um, yeah. and support me in that. But her motivation was literally family. And some people that's all their motivation needs to be. Mm-hmm. And I, I think being if you want more time and you're lamenting not having enough time with your kids, whatever age they are or your grandkids, that's where that emotional response most people can relate to. They yeah. want some freedom to be able to either support their kids or be home more or whatever, you know, and, and we certainly, that personally motivates me. So some sometimes it's that simple. People just want to be home with their families and have freedom. And sometimes it's a necessity like caring. Uh, mm. You need to care for a sick loved one or you need to look after a child or someone who's got more severe ongoing needs. Um, sometimes that can be enough. But the people who do become financially independent also do incredible stuff in startup land. Mm-hmm. Um, when you don't have to worry about, and, and there's this real, um, I find it very amusing every time I talk to VCs and they're like, we need investors who've like put the mortgage on the house in the game. And I'm like, so you want financially stressed people with their IQ reduced making decisions in startups? They all find that very amusing. Mm. Um, I find it hilarious. I'm like, there's no way I want a stressed founder if I'm investing money. I want them to be at their peak decision making. Right. Um, the people who are financially independent, who have got the income from whatever assets they own, can do incredible things in startup land because they can risk a little bit more. They know they're going to be able to eat. They And, and so mm. you see incredible startups of all sorts of descriptions, a lot in the social enterprise space. Mm-hmm. Um, I can't think of any I want to list specifically, but they're, they're where I see a lot more people that are financially yeah. independent in the social enterprise and, and not-for-profit space. Mm-hmm. Lots of people go on to volunteer. So lots of people that end up taking those six-month working holidays to another third-world country. Uh, I say mm-hmm. third world. I don't think that's probably the thing you're supposed to say now, but you know what I mean, a, a developing country yeah. that yeah. needs assistance to build a school or build a hospital or whatever. They go and do those kinds of things. Um, some people that I know are financially independent and just carry on. No one at work knows they're financially independent. No one knows that they don't have to be there. They're there by choice. Oh. They're there because they love their jobs. Mm. Um, and then, of course, heaps of people in the influencer space. You would see a lot of this at the moment with all the newspaper reports from ASIC. Lots of people ranging from excellent independent financial education where they're just trying to give people ideas all the way through to copy my trading routine and uh, and thank you, we'll give you a bit nasty big fine for that because you're basically giving financial advice. Um, so you get a bit of a range of those. Mm. But I think the, the unifying principle is that that freedom and choice that people aim for is what you get specifically around your time. It doesn't fix all your problems. doesn't make you mysteriously happy suddenly. Of course. If you're unhappy at the moment, it's not going to fix that. But what it will do is give you time time and space to go and find out what will work for you. And mm. I think that's really important. People, it won't it won't fix everything, just allows you to focus on something other than having to earn your wages. Love this. Now, let's talk a little bit about the courses that you have, because there are some people that come to seek financial advice and very obviously they either aren't ready for financial advice, they can't afford financial advice, they don't want financial advice, but they just want to learn the basics. From what I can gather from your website, that is what you do. So can you just tell us a little bit about the money school and and the courses that you offer? Because I've looked at them and they seem very unique. (laughs) Yeah. Well, I think they are. And this is an interesting point. One of the things that's been fascinating around that influencer talk is that there is not a category for financial education. You Mm. can be a teacher or you can be an advisor, but they don't have a financial education qualification. So I'm actually self-appointed. I'm just basically teaching what I've learned, but I've had a curriculum developer work with me Mm -hmm. because I'm not a teacher. I I would call myself a coach in my professional life as an engineer. I did a lot of coaching, but um, what I have built is standalone self-delivered courses that are very cheap or low cost. Yeah. So, you know, there's a free course on how to get out of debt. So if you do get someone who's stuck with debt, it's a 30-minute 
how to get out. And I talk about the avalanche method and all those things and, and how to calculate that stuff. And that's a really popular course. That's on Udemy and it's had about 5,000 people through it there. So I've got students all over the world. Mm. Um, yeah, 100 and something countries and all these different languages. It's lovely. Um, all the way through to um, my big course, which is about growing your wealth and investing. And it's got some economics in it. So I don't prescribe. I, I really am strong on um, people need to choose their own adventure with money. Yep. Yep. If they don't choose something that works for them, and you talked a lot about this, there is a maths answer to a lot of things, but some of it is about risk tolerance, like not, and not like on a math scale. Like I'm less risk tolerant than my mother was, and she is 30 years older than me. Uh, so it's mm. not necessarily just this demographic thing, it's a personal thing, but also, totally. um, you know, what kind of security you need, um, your relationship to delayed gratification versus instant gratification, mm-hmm. how you manage your relationship. There's a lot of stuff that's really nuanced. So I, rather than saying, well, you must save 20%, um, I stick to three rules, which is save, buy assets, avoid bad debt. That's it. Mm-hmm. And the course talks about the types of assets there are, the ways investment works, how debt works, a bit of economics in there, which is really important. People understanding what inflation and interest rates are and understanding what GDP means and growth mm. and um, those kinds of things. So that's the, the big course, which is about uh, growing your wealth. Um, I've got a, like a little course on shares and a bit on managing money. Um, but my book is also a great resource. It's very similar to what's in the courses. So if you prefer to read or listen to an audio book and my voice hasn't driven you crazy during this whole podcast, um, you can hear me reading the book. <laughs> Laura, you <laughs> read your audio book. That's great. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, That's it was – It was well, because I had done the TEDx talk, they were like, well, we have to have your voice, don't we, because people know what you sound like. It's not usual for an mm-hmm. author um, to have done the TEDx talk first. Uh, but that's what happened. Um, so yeah, it was a really, it's been fascinating. I loved publishing with Penguin and they were absolutely brilliant and the editing they gave was really good. But there's one um, diagram in my book, which I think it's on about page 30, which is really helpful for people, which is just this visual that I treat money like a water course, like a river running through your life. And there's only a few points at which you make decisions and that overarching structure is important, but the how you get to each thing, it's up to you what your saving rate is, what investments you're going to choose, whether you're going to voluntarily contribute to super or not. Those things are things you get to tweak and decide. And so I try to, in all of my education, just give the here's the pros and cons of each one. Mm. Here's what's up and down. And now you pick. And I think that's really helpful. And I've had certainly quite a few advisors. um, They have put their clients through the courses before. They often email me and organize to get uh, a login for one of their people so that one of their clients. So just like you said, they can, they can skill up because as an advisor, a, an educated client has got to be a head start, right? Because you can totally. focus on getting the most value out of it, right? You, you can, yeah. you don't spend your, your hours going, okay, well, this is how interest works. You know, like you, you, if you can get that basic stuff covered and, and everybody's got the same language and they're aware of their options and then you can focus on extracting as much value as you can from what's your personal situation, helping them overcome the obstacles that, that, that come up when they ha- learn those things. I think that's where I see most people get stuck. They go, okay, look, I get the theory, but now for me specifically, what do I need to do? And that's where I have to go, well, now you need to go talk to a counsellor, an advisor, a planner, yeah. might be an accountant. Because you do need that personal help in some cases, particularly in complex cases. Yeah. Oh, um, if you haven't already, please go and watch Lacey's TEDx talk. It is fantastic. Um, and it piqued my interest talking about non-traditional retirements. As a 30-something-year-old woman who is about to embark on my own first one, stay tuned, everyone. I'll tell you how I go and when I come back. Uh, but I do think we need to – be really loud about saying there is not one way and here's a way that I did it that it's different and let me tell you more about it. And as you say, it doesn't fix all of the problems in your life, but it gives you some space and some options. So Lacey, thank you so much. Just a couple of quick things. Um, We're going to do some rapid fire questions in a second, but if people want to learn more about you, the great work that you do, how can people find you and what is the name of the book? Um, So the best place to go is Mm -hmm. moneyschool.org.au and the book is the same name, Money School. Mm -hmm. So if you Google Money School and, of course, my surname, Philippich, there's not a lot of Philippiches out there. So you'll be able to find me pretty easy um, Mm -hmm. if you just give it a Google and, uh, yeah, check out YouTube for the TEDx talk. Yes, do. Uh, Are you ready for some rapid fire questions? I am. Fire away. (laughs) Okay. Same ones every week because I just think the answers are fascinating. I would love to know what is one thing that you do to look after your mental health? I focus on getting really good sleep. So my phone is banned from my bedroom now. 
that has made the biggest impact on my sleep. Wow. I do not have my phone in the bedroom at night. And you survived. I have an alarm clock. You survived. Yes. Yes. It's, I'd made the change about six months ago and it's been revolutionary for my sleep. So I think good sleep is probably, and this is me speaking as a parent, my children are six and nine. I'm finally getting good sleep again now mm-hmm. after many years of broken sleep. I really value it. Oh, love that. Uh, what is a piece of advice that you would give younger Lacey? Well, I'm pretty happy with what younger Lacey did. So I would yes. probably go back and give me a pat on the back and tell me to, to have faith in myself. I remember having a lot of self-doubt, particularly when I went to buy that first property. Even my lecturers and professors were going, what are you doing? You're mad. They didn't own properties. And I, I'm glad I stuck with it, but I remember agonizing over it. I would go back and say, this is a good choice. Carry on and have a bit of faith. Back yourself a bit. Bless you for carrying on anyway, because I think if my professors were saying no, that would really f- – really scare me. So well done you. Uh, what is, this feels funny asking you, what is one big bucket list item that you're yet to tick off? Uh, a mini retirement in Europe. I've been meaning to do it since about 2018. Uh, I am desperate to go um, try living for six months between Italy and Spain and we will one day do it. But of course there's been a pandemic. Um, and before that, mm. my husband didn't want to take children that wouldn't listen to no, don't run in front of that train, you know, when they're too little. Now they're old enough that they'll actually obey instructions um, and the borders are open. I'm hoping in the next couple of years, we can get a six month mini retirement overseas. That sounds amazing. And they'll be old enough to remember it. That's awesome. Yes. Yes. Which will be a bonus. I won't just be going, see, look, there's you, there's you next to the leaning tower. I know you don't remember it, but I promise you, we took you. Yeah. It should be a bonus. (laughs) You were not superimposed in that photo. Um, I'm going to add your book to my list, but I would love to know a book that you think I should read as part of my fake book club. Your fake book club. Look, I, I picked two so that I um, had one that was fiction and one that was nonfiction. So Thank the you. nonfiction one I'd recommend is Your Money or Your Life, which is by Vicki Robin. And this is the original Fire Bible. So she wrote it in 1992. She oh. coined the term financially independent retiring early. It gets credited to Pete Adonai, the Mr. Money Mustache. I got very angry with yeah. Money Magazine last month when they said, oh, Peter Adonai came up with it. No, mate, when he was still a toddler – maybe even not born yet, I can't remember, Um, Vicky Robin wrote about that. So, no, sorry. So, this is like the original uh, Bible. It's very good. She's a fantastic woman. And if you want to see someone who's like taken their financial independence and been revolutionary, she's so big on the sustainability movement. She has taken her financial independence to work on um, climate change and all that sort of stuff. Fantastic. Like her her life story. She's she's incredible. Vicky Robin. American, fantastic. Check her out. And then I – Yes, and then I had to pick a fiction book because I'm a, I am actually read a vastly more fiction and you need to relax. Charlotte McConaughey, or McConaughey, I can't, I'm not sure how you're supposed to say it, probably McConaughey. This is because I spend too much time reading instead of listening. Um, Migrations, it's been published under later, lately. She's an Australian author. I have read, I read this book, which is now Migrations. I've got the original with the last migration title. Um, and there were Once Wolves. And I could not put them down. They were captivating. If you like to relax, and that's – I actually spend a lot of time on my mini retirements reading and yeah. rereading. Like I'm currently rereading um, Terry Pratchett's Discworld series, uh, that kind of thing. Those books were just – they took me out of myself. So if you struggle to relax, reading something like that at night will, will switch your brain off. And you've just got to make sure you start early enough that if you can't put it down, you do still get some sleep. <laughs> Back to point one of rapid fire questions. Um, <laughs> I love this, and I'm sli- I'm an avid reader, but I'm getting slightly overwhelmed because I've st- I've added this question into my weekly podcast, and so the list of books is growing at a rate that I just cannot sort of kind of keep up with. But perhaps on my my first mini retirement, it gives me an opportunity and some space to do it. Well, on the plane, at least you know, if you're yes. flying somewhere, you can. Uh, yep, yeah, lots of lots of time then. <laughs> Lacey, your story is phenomenal. I, you have been so generous with your time and your insights. I want to say an enormous thank you for being today's guest. Can't wait to read your book and learn more. So a huge thank you again from the entire XY community. Well, thanks so much for having me, Jess, and well done on the excitement that you bring to the topic. It's a tough one to get people really pumped about sometimes, but you just do a magic job. I've, it's been a delight. Oh, thank you. Thank you.